The theme of this conference is entitled Facing Tomorrow with Today's Students, the Stakeholder's Perspective. And the rationale for this conference, um, it is intended to heighten the awareness of the behavioral issues that impact school or school society and seeks to utilize a frontal approach to address them. Additionally, the conference aims to provide a forum for brainstorming of ideas towards the finding of solutions. We acknowledge that today's child will be tomorrow's adult. And so, we accept the need to be looking constantly to ways of maintaining our social fabric. So without much further ado, I'm going to get right into it because we've already lost about 10 to 15 minutes of our scheduled start time for this session. I'm going to introduce you to our first speaker, Mr. Roderick Rudder. Mr. Rudder is a senior education officer. He's also a gentleman, he told me. I'm going to just give a little um, narrative of his presentation. Now, his presentation is entitled Case Study Format Scenarios of Behavioral Issues. Now, this session takes a sample look at matters of school deviance. The session examines the procedure options that are open to school management as they deal with situations. The session is intended to create awareness about the seriousness of procedure failure where policy is ignored or breached. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to turn you over now to Mr. Roderick Rudder. And let me say that we are here for conversation and we want to have fun and we want to speak openly. As the minister said, we're going to open our minds and our hearts and say what is in our heart, say what is on our minds. Let us have a very good conversation. We're hoping to find, to record our findings and also to have some suggestions for all the powers that be to put in place after this conference. I think it's a very important call to have all you here as stakeholders to deal with issues that you're going to hear about, that we're going to discuss in this session. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Roger Rudder, Dr. Roger Rudder, sorry. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm not going to sit here and give you a lecture. And because of the time constraints, we are already running late. So I have already determined in my mind that I have to make adjustments to the session as any good teacher would. So therefore, I'm going to get straight into the business and deal with the case studies. Now, it is not for me to tell you anything other than you are invited to express your views so that we can come to some consensus as to how the system is actually working. There's a difference between how it is supposed to work and what really happens on the ground on a day-to-day -day basis. And I will therefore skip through some of the scenarios. I was pre actually presented with about eight scenarios to discuss with you since the original facilitator could not be present this morning. I had a very little, very little time to prepare. But nevertheless, it is within the context of what um, we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, I'm going to go straight to the, the, the first scenario, because you would have been given some background. And I'm going to go straight to this one. I'm going to probably use about three or four of the eight scenarios. It, now, the reason why it's so small is the best I could do to get the entire scenario on one slide rather than having to use two slides. So Chris hit the switch, which says back of the room. Right. I hope you can see it a little better now. All right. I'll give you a minute or two to just take a 
a, a quick look at the scenario and then we will get down to some discussion. The whole idea is to look at what are the kind of procedural options which are open to school management to address the behavioral issues that we are confronted with and to examine the extent to which A, these behavioral issues are effectively managed or dealt with at the school level and whether or not we need to look at some kind of adjustment, whether it be to the standard procedures or to review aspects of the legislation that govern how we function within the school system. Now, this 13-year-old second form student was injured. He presented with his shoulder heavily bandaged and painful. His mother complained that, he was at, that she was at a loss as to the circumstances under which her son was injured at school. That's the first thing. He was injured at school. She further went on to say that she received a call from the school asking her to meet her son at the hospital as he was injured. She was unable to do so, but her mother met him at the hospital instead. At the time of the parents' report, two days had elapsed. Important, two days had elapsed since the incident occurred, but she was unable to meet with the principal or anyone at the school to give clarity on the matter. She wanted clarity. She was told that the earliest that she could have a meeting with the principal was nine days after the incident occurred. The student's left shoulder was fractured in two places, and he is now to see a specialist for further consultation. The student is left-handed. The floor is open. What are the key elements that we should focus on in this particular scenario? And what are the procedural matters that we should first seek to address in this particular case? And as we think about it and discuss it, we need to identify what are some of the flaws and how some of those flaws can be corrected and whether or not the school or the school's management by, might be in some kind of breach along the way as it relates to the administrative matters in this particular case. So the floor is open. Who wants to go first? I see Noveline. I, uh, I, I felt that you would have been key because I, I saw your, the smile on your face from very early. Go ahead. I'm always smiling. Can you use the microphone? Yes. Uh, I can pass it around. I don't know if it's a procedural matter or not, but beyond that, I find it rather strange that it would take nine days for a school to interact with a parent whose child has been injured on the compound on the school. To me, that is the basic, a basic um, issue. Uh, if I'm not a parent, but I appreciate uh, humanity and man, and I think that the need for earlier communication and Empathy, as the Prime Minister, sorry, as the Minister of Education said earlier, is uh, certainly lacking from this scenario based on what you have um, presented there. If I can intervene for one moment and, and, and make something clear to everyone, these scenarios are all based on actual incidents that took place in our system. What was extracted would have been the names of the students the schools involved, the parents involved, but there are actual incidents that happened in our system. They were not taken off the internet, they were not taken from the United States or anywhere else. They are cases that we have had to address in our system. Continue. My last comment would be that as a human being, um, and a child or anybody is injured, the first, one of the first things that I would have to do were I a leader, were to communicate with the family members um, in so, at some basic level. Okay, that's fine. Any other opinions? Go ahead. My response is this, is that I don't see how you can call me and tell me that my child, meet my child at the hospital. He's injured. You don't, you don't explain to me the, the, the nature of the injury. I just meet him at the hospital. He's there by himself. 
the first thing I, 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 I would want to know is the nature of this injury I, I, as a parent or as a principal. As a parent, right. as a parent you're speaking now. As a parent, you would need to know that. Right. And, and as a principal, I think that, that if you call me as a parent now and turn it around, that you would explain to me the nature of my child's illness. Don't just tell me meet him at the hospital. I think something wrong with your head. Okay. All right. Let me just grab the mic. I should really have two mics in here. All right. Over here. Good morning. I'm Braden Springer, Deputy Chair of Nessa Vaughan School. I'm going to look at it from the school perspective and also intertwine it with my personal experience with my wife who was ill and my daughter fell at the, the, the stadium. From the school perspective, I believe that the, the way, without giving out too much information to cause panic, the, the way they told the parent to meet them at the hospital, I can understand that. Because to give too much information might cause a lot, you might say something that the parent might not hear properly and they might misinterpret the situation, hence panic can ensue. Reason being, my wife was ill, very ill. My daughter fell from the tops, the top of the stand. Six flights down she was, and frankly speaking, I thought that she had lost her eye, her eye or she would have been dead. I didn't call or explain anything to her mother. I went straight to the hospital. After I recognized that the situation was kind of calm and I can better tell her what had happened, I didn't call. Although she reacted um, hostile at first, which I expected, but it, she calm, calmed down quickly thereafter. Hence, by Asking the parent to come to the hospital, I can understand that because the severity of the matter can only be handled by a medical practitioner, not you. Okay. In terms of the length of time that the parent now took to really get a handle around their child's needs is a bother to me as well because if you would have been cognizant of the fact that your child has been injured at school. And then, door at the bottom, it say you take, you can you only can get there nine days thereafter. Unless I'm misinterpreting something. It tells me, therefore, there's a lapse in, in, the, pers in the parent's responsibility. The school, sorry. In the school's responsibility of getting the information to the parent. So on one hand, while the school would have started out, in my view, on the right path. Right. There was a lapse. Hence, there are some things that I would suggest later on. Quickly. How we could um. Okay. All right. How we could deal with that? You're making your suggestions now. No, I will okay. come after. All right, uh, Mr. Perry, who you wanted to speak, and yes. then I'm going to try to guide you a, a little bit more so that we can get maximum out of this session. Uh, All right. I'm Phil Perry. Now. Looking at this, I, I have a lot of problems with the whole scenario set out, but that um, been the case. The question seems to be one of communication, uh, and even now the scenario is not well communicated to us, because um, we have a 13-year-old student with a bandage and painful shoulder, who's now at the hospital or not at the hospital, whose parent is informed two days later or not to um, informed at all who um, the parent child is injured she's asked to meet at the hospital but can't make it you know and, and and so there seem to be a number of issues that we really have to delve into now if I were to get a call on my how busy I was with the Prime Minister or other and that my child was at the hospital I had to meet him that is where I would be I wouldn't be too busy to get there um, 
That seems problematic for me. I believe that the communication between the school and the parent, um, there, there, there has to be a serious disjunct there because to my knowledge there are very few schools in Barbados, if any that I can think of, that would have a time frame between one day and nine days to communicate a parent to a parent about a child with an injury. So I have, I have some difficulty with that. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Sandra Ford, Chairman of St. Michael's School. This is just a small observation. Um, I noticed it says that she, she further went on to say that she received a call from the school. My question is, who made the call? And as I say, it's very simple. Okay. I just didn't know who made the call. Okay, if I can further streamline the discussion from two perspectives from two perspectives what based on this scenario which as I was told it was taken from the records of the ministry I didn't write the scenario the information was actually extracted I don't know what was left out exactly I was just presented with the scenarios but this is my question to you I'll deal with the school side first from an administrative standpoint what are the key components that should be addressed in this scenario up front up front based on a the law and b what is reasonable in relation to the fact that the personnel of the school whether it be principal your heads or whatever are acting and local parentis on behalf of the parents and therefore, what should be the key components that we ought to address in this particular scenario? Well, thank you. The first thing from a legal perspective that I'm looking at here, it doesn't state what caused the accident mm -hmm. with the child. And then, from the other point, I will look to see what was the principal approach to this matter. The two things, they are the two most important things here. Then, th what they should have said is how the child come by this incident. Nothing so is being said there. There are a few elements that are, I'm looking to, to, to get, hear from you that I'm not hearing as yet, but I will prompt you along the way. Good morning. You're, do, do, you're focusing on what is here. I want you to focus on what ought to happen. What ought to happen? I'm listening for it. Continue. What, what should have happened? Come on. I'm coming. I'm coming around. What Go should ahead. have happened, I think, is that someone should have been from the school at the hospital with the son to meet with the mother and therefore informed her. I agree with um, the speaker here. I don't remember his name, Mrs. Springer. Where there's some things that you wouldn't say to a parent on the telephone because the person could just you know get an accident on the way to the hospital or something of the sort but when the mother gets to the hospital whoever gets to the hospital the school representative is there to inform the parent and to let the parent know initially this is what has happened and then set up a meeting for the very next day to come in and sit and let's go through to, to tell you exactly now what transpired what the school is going to do to ensure that your son is well looked after and then um, can come back into school and, and follow on from there Here, here. My, my, my first observation really was that the, it was a 13-year-old minor that was that's involved in this. And when a child of that age is involved in anything, there are certain procedures that have to be followed. Now, I'm, I, I'm, I'm taking on at face value that everything else was followed, parents were contacted, and were explained, etc. That's the first concern I have, a 13-year-old minor. The second concern I have is the responsibility of the, the school in dealing with this matter. And when you look at that last paragraph, it blatantly states that the, the school was in contravention of, of their obligations under the Education Act. So those are my two problems, the 13-year-old and the role of the school in this issue. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Uh, Dalton Medford, St. Michael School, Deputy Chairperson. I want to bring a little a different perspective from to this um, scenario from a business background. Um, 
I worked in a business and I um, sit on a number of businesses boards and if this had occurred in the private sector there's a protocol that would be in place somebody takes a report somebody makes out a report somebody's responsible to ensuring that that information is passed on in the correct manner and I would think I would think that a 13 year old child they got to be protocols at school who takes the report who contacts the parent what do we say to the parent so uh, this scenario is a little puzzling for me somebody has to take leadership in this matter to ensure that the parent is informed properly and a meeting is held at the shortest time with the parent because there's a legal matter yeah. and in a business the first thing you think about protecting is your business oh, yeah. you could lose your business in a situation like this so I can't see how something like this could happen in the school okay. thank you and education is our business The last comment, and then I'm going to bring this scenario to a close by highlighting some of the procedural. You, you want to speak as well, Orson? Okay. Some of the procedural and, and, and legal components that we, we kind of glossed around, but we, we really have to zero in on. Go ahead. Pleasant good morning to Major. all. Major Brathwaite, principal of Ellerslie School. I would want to imagine, given the scenario, that the first business of the day is to seek medical attention for the child mm -hmm. while at the same time having the parent informed certainly the chairman of the board and indeed the ministry of education just to let them know that something has happened and to get that child to the nearest medical facility for treatment of course, if there is a first aid person who can render some first aid um, to the individual, we can do that while the ambulance is on its way. Secondly, with respect to communicating uh, with that parent, I do not believe because you have not been able to carry out any investigations of any significant nature that you say to the parent, look, this has happened we are in the process of conducting our investigations or we will conduct our investigations but we would want to have you meet with the child and the teacher escorting that child to the hospital um, as a course of urgency because the parent is the person who has the responsibility to make any decisions that the medical facility will want um, that person to make as opposed to um, a teacher or anything of that sort. So those are my initial okay. um, steps. Uh, of course, the the report and so on will have to be followed. All those persons who would have witnessed what would have happened, you will have to pull them to get reports and so on. But I think that you have to take a step-by-step -step approach. Okay, Arson. Go ahead. Good morning to all. I'm Orson Allen, principal of the Alexander School. I, I must say that I, I find, I will just comment on the, the latter half of the, the scenario because I, I would want to know why the principal wasn't available and if the record is correct, sir, and this is the point I made, if the correct, because this, I have questions about this based on how I would operate and I, I mean how I would proceed. I have significant problems with, with this whole issue of the, the time span. Um, the earliest that sh the, the parent will be able to meet the principal at night. But my question here that must be answered, is there some other reason why the principal is unavailable, was unav unavailable for such a meeting? And if the, if the parent's demand was only to meet with the principal in a scenario like this, because maybe there was some other person who could have brought some clarity, but maybe it was only the, was the principal available? was there, um, let us say the school was out for a few days. I don't know what the circumstances were, but I have a significant issue with that because the procedure in school really, from, from our perspective, from what I am aware, is that initially we will get, first we will do as um, Mayor Bradford said, we will seek to get medical attention for our child immediately. We will inform the various stakeholders. Normally, while we are working with that, my secretary will be calling the parent so that I can speak to a parent, let the parent know that we have an issue here. Sometimes I don't get to the ministry just yet. Um, I will call the, 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 um, the 
Secretary Treasurer, let her know we'll call. Give the chairman a call. If it's a significant issue, tell the chairman, listen, we have a significant issue here. Sometimes I don't do that immediately, but the first call is to ensure that the student's well-being is taken care of. And that is how we will go. And then after that, we will then make the move where we will have the parent in. A report is done, but we will have the parent in, and we will say, as Brother Braffitt said again also, sometimes you, I will say in a day or two, we will sit with you because sometimes you need also to find out the circumstances. I can't just call you and tell you, maybe the child was brought to the office and we are aware that there was an injury, but sometimes we don't understand the, all that transpired. So we need to clarify that. And then we will have that meeting and from there then we will make all the whatever other moves we need to make in terms of addressing the circumstances that obviously will come out of that meeting. But I, I really find it difficult to understand what, sir, transpired. Okay. Well, let me say to you that disregarding this particular scenario, in my experience working in the ministry, there have been several instances where schools have failed to follow what is the expected procedure. Reports of serious injuries were weeks in coming to the ministry. Actually, there are a, a number of cases that are being litigated right now where schools have been caught in serious breach of even documenting, documenting the actual injuries and principles having failed for months, not weeks or days, months to submit a report. It's a fact. There are breaches that actually take place and there are some lapses that happen in the system. We don't always want to hear the truth or admit that there are lapses, but there are. Now, I will just highlight for you to bring this to a close, this particular one to a close. The section of the Education Act, Regulation 31, that says where a pupil is injured or falls ill, while on the premises of any school during school hours or in the course of any official school activity, the principal or where the principal is unavailable, any other teacher shall obtain medical attention for the pupil and inform the parent as soon as possible. Where it has been necessary to obtain medical attention on the paragraph four, the last paragraph, the principal or any other person in charge of the school shall inform the chief education officer or the board within three days or as soon as practicable after obtaining the medical attention. Now, in some cases, schools have developed procedural standards by which they capture information relating to matters of injury and other problems within the school. Some schools actually have, for example, accident or injury report forms that have to be completed. In the case of, um, let's say, for example, um, there's a particular offense committed by a, a particular child or group of students. There is a form which is actually completed by the students where they're given an opportunity to, to give their side of things. Some schools, the Education Act require that there, there's a disciplinary book in which breaches by students are recorded, but some schools don't maintain those. Some schools might have um, a, a, a disciplinary card. They may be using an electron tracker in order to capture some of these incidents, but the, the, the thing is to be consistent. Consistency is important. Effective communication is also important. As the uh, principal from Alexandra said, you need to have time to investigate, yes, but there are some steps that must be taken almost immediately pending further investigation. Because at the end of the day, if the parent decides to pursue the matter in court, then we, meaning the ministry, will be found wanting. If we have failed, along the way to properly capture from a business perspective what we were supposed to do. And part of the reason for, for this, despite whatever shortcomings we may highlight in the, in the scenario, the point is 
we need to aim for consistency in the application of the administrative procedures and standards. Because failing to do that, we may find ourselves on the wrong side of the law. But not only that, failure to take action almost immediately can also result in an innocent life being lost quite easily. There have been instances where, and I'm not going to go through that, all of these scenarios, I'm going to use one more scenario because of time. But there have been instances where students have been reporting to school administrators, cases where they've been threatened or bullied and stuff like that. And in some cases, the children are not taken seriously. And only when an incident actually happens, then there's a reaction. I have on my phone right now an incident that took place a few weeks ago at a school where a prefect, a prefect, actually, I would say, seriously assaulted a junior student. The youngster was in, you would call it short pants, Kiki, and he was trying to walk away from this prefect who was actually pursuing him. And I, I, I don't want to show the video. But what it shows is that while this youngster turned his back, I believe it was a bad thing for him to do, he turned his back. The, the prefect actually, the, the cuff that, the, or slap that he gave this youngster, it could have broken his neck. But the youngster's back was turned. He went to pick up his bag, and he had a very serious blow. And then he retaliated. And both students were punished. Both students were punished. But you can see from the video, I don't know what happened prior to that, and it was very early in the morning before school started, that this youngster was actually pursued by the older boy. And after he was assaulted, he, he responded. And these things actually happen. And more and more, we're seeing them being caught now on cell phones. And that's another matter that I will deal with in another session. But we have to be absolutely careful in terms of how we document document yes go ahead you said that in I know you quoted the education app um, shall obtain medical attention for the child as a matter of urgency my question here to you because sometime in trying to cause I'm just trying to clarify something in trying to obtain this medical attention, let us say we call the um, the hospital, we were unable to get transportation, and maybe we tried some other avenues and so on. But we have a child there in our assessment who is critically injured or ill. What is the advice of the Ministry of Education in terms of addressing that child who we have on hand and who, in our view, there is an emergency situation? Do we pursue moving the child, do we pursue, let us say, transporting that child to the ministry, do we, I mean to the hospital, do we, what, what is the advice here? Because the, 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 it is a matter of urgency, we expect to get medical attention for this child as soon as possible. What is the, what is the word on the ground here? Well, I, I can't give you in detail an applicable response because it depends on the circumstances. Now, I am not a medical person. Dr. Retta. L We're let me interrupt. What Mr. Aline is asking without asking, we have been told by our union not wait, wait a to take wait, the children wait, anywhere. Wait a minute, Mr. Jackman. Wait a minute, Mr. Jackman. Wait a minute, Mr. Jackman. Wait a minute. And let me deal with it from this perspective. I am not a medical professional. You are not. But there's a child who is seriously injured. We have to make a judgment call. We have to make a judgment call. Depending, and, and this, I mean, we, we, whether or not your union has instructed you to do A or B or C, we have to make a human call. It's a human call. At the end of the day, if a child 
uh, depend on if you know the nature of the injury because in some cases medical personnel will tell you don't try to move the person call for medical assistance it, it is all relative to the particular situation but in a, a case where there's an, an emergency where a child's life is seriously at risk I will ask you the question will you leave the child to die on your hands even I'm just asking the question, will you leave the child to die on your hands? Because it is all about the given situation. Let, 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 go, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, you go ahead. If that were my child, I would sue that principle, sir. If, the, if, if, if I can find out, if, that, if because that child was not given um, assisted in getting immediate medical attention. I would sue that principal, sir. And I've known of a case where that happened, sir. I will sue that principal. That's my response, right? But, but, but there, there, there's another question I wanted. Just, just hold for a second, just hold for a second. Because of the limited time, I probably will not even do another scenario. We can finish on this. <laughs> we can finish on this because we started late. And we only have about five minutes left. About ten. So yes. Yeah, so we will let's deal with this one. And this has gone to another level where we're talking about we're talking about a very sensitive component where ethics ethics comes into play. Ethics, okay? I'll, I'll bring it back to you, Mr. Jackman. Um, and Mr. Springer, I'm coming back to you. And I saw, yes, over here. No here to look at solutions. If, previous if the union has given you an instruction. Administrations of the ministry have also warned that teachers taking children in their vehicles to seek medical attention do so at their own risk. But the, the now, speaking I hold, wait, as an hold, individual, hold second, I Jackman. would take the child. Hold a second, Mr. Jackman. But they will take, you hold are doing second, it at Mr. your Jackman. own risk. And uh, you will not get any backing from the government of Barbados if anything so. happens. I don't think so. Not based on what the act says. But wait a minute, wait a minute. But Chief, before you, before you go, <laughs> let me give you a personal experience I had. And at the time, I didn't know anything about being sued. I, I was probably... Um, in the service for just a few years. I was the only teacher, male teacher, at Grisette's Primary School, I think about 1989, or thereabouts, okay? A young female student was climbing the stairs, had a Lucozade. You know, Lucozade was in the plastic bottle as it is now. It was in a very hard bottle back then. And running up the stairs, the student fell, and the bottle broke and punctured her in the pelvic area. Okay, somewhere along here. As I said, it was the only male teacher at the school. All the females panicked. I was the youngest member of staff at the school. Had no idea about what, are, what were the legal implications. I happened to have had a car at the point in time. We tried to get the ambulance from the hospital, none. BDF, none. There were no private ambulances as we have them now. There was one choice left. I called the mother. The mother lived just, if you know, the housing area is not too far away. We called the mother, got her in my car, took them both to the hospital. A couple Hours later, I got a call thanking me for what I had done. What the medical team at the hospital said, seven minutes more, and that child would have bled to death. All right, seven minutes more. The funny thing about it is, trying to get from Grisettes to the hospital, my horn wouldn't work, the hazard lights wouldn't work, the traffic was heavy, and I was just a youngster just trying to do something that was right. They tried to tie off, um, put pressure on the leg to prevent, and it was, a, I think it was a, a vein or something like that that got punctured. She would have died. And at the point in time, I didn't know Mr. Paris about right or wrong. It was that I had to save a life. All right? And then Mrs. Archer, 
former senior. She called me in the ministry one day, thought I had done something wrong. But it was thanked by them because of what could have happened had this child passed away. Now, I always remember that when I hear these stories. Because at the end of the day, we have to make a judgment call. If I have to be sued for trying to save a life, let the judgment go the way it's supposed to go. But it's a judgment call. Mr. Paris, let yeah. me hear you. Before Mr. Paris, right? I, I just want to come in quickly to say I, I don't know just about the sorry. pronouncements. I, I'm fine. You can hear me. No, no, I don't recording, know recording, about the... Recording, recording, recording. Oh, yeah. I don't know... I don't know about the pronouncements made by previous administrations, but what I do know is that the laws of this land protect persons who act like out of care for somebody else. There is no court of law in Barbados that will prosecute you and find you guilty for committing an offense if you exercise due care and love and do it out of those concerns. The, the Education Act will, I, I will have let in me read it section. Just let certain me read section. sections, but there are other laws and acts that right, also, so you me, see, you have to be careful interpreting acts in isolation. Let me read it for you. And we can come to that I stopped next. at the previous paragraph, which said that the, prince, the, the chief should be notified within three days. Let me read the last paragraph. And it says, where the principal or a teacher of any school obtains medical attention for a people on the paragraph four, which is the one I mentioned that if the child is injured, that principal or teacher is not liable okay. Okay. for any act okay. or omission okay. relating to the obtaining of medical attention done reasonably and in good faith. Yeah. The law says that. that yes. The law says that. And there are other laws. The law says that. There are other laws that in other So if you're advised otherwise, say I am say, I'm still saying it is yeah. a judgment call. Yeah. All right, Mr. So Paris, and then I'm coming back to Brighton and the general. What's your name, sir? Dalton. Dalton. And the guidance counselor. It got answered? I was not going to leave it out, you know. I expected it to come. Go ahead, let's go. Yes. I just want to say that I believe that all of us ought to recognize that schools must always be seen as caring institutions. And uh, the actions, therefore, of schools must always reveal that caring nature. And should efforts be made to seek assistance for a child who is injured or ill, using the normal means of public ambulance transport etc and sometimes we try to find the private ambulances as well there are times when they are not available to mm -hmm. I would ensure I would always um, advise that the schools whoever is there available to take the chance to take that child to get to the nearest medical um, medical facility that can deal with that particular issue um, I would have to support the chief education officer on this one and say that not very long ago correspondents would have come into schools indicating that in the event of such injury or illness that that medical attention should be sought and that principals or any school personnel taking such action would be absolved in such a scenario because um, of taking that reasonable care and attention for the student. So that information has actually been sent out by the ministry in recent times, quoting the very last part of the act, which was just read yeah. by Dr. Rutter. Um, so that I, initially, I was a little surprised when Dr. Rutter said he wouldn't know, he doesn't know how to respond to that when it was asked earlier. Because like I said that particular scenario, that particular correspondence did come out from the ministry um, to schools and so I would re-emphasize that schools must always be caring institutions. Okay just a clarification I was responding to the instruction of the union mm -hmm. not in terms right. of okay. the step to be taken the union's instruction mm -hmm.
its members. I, I don't. Um, I wouldn't know how to respond to that. Just one ninety um, seconds. To but I, we have to wrap up now. So very yeah, quickly, 90, 90 I'm going to give those persons mm -hmm. who were eagerly waiting for a chance to mm -hmm. say words. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Yeah, just Alingu, the gentleman yeah. here, mm -hmm. Brayden, and right. QC. Just suffice it to say that we have always no been involved, and as far as I know, in ensuring that we get medical attention for students. And we have done everything possible to ensure that students are well taken, the students on our charge are well taken care of. I just want to just make one last point. However, I've had an experience already where we were in a very difficult situation. We had a child that passed out. I miss ED, we were there. We, we, and the reality is that we tried every possible, the, there was no possibility that we can get any transport. And then I called the parent, and this is what, one, what the advice would be. I called the parent, I said to her, we have your child here, the child is certainly not looking well at all. I wish to move this child to the hospital. And her instruction to me, do not move the child. Subsequently, the child died. It is something that I've lived with for four years. But I'm saying to you that the instruction was, my plan was to move that child. Remember, we, that was the plan. And the reality is that the parents said to me, don't move the child. So I'm just trying to show that in as much sometimes that you want to move, you want to work. The reality, that was the, and the truth is, if I didn't get through the parent, I would have had that child in my vehicle. But I got through to the parent, and the parent's advice was don't move the child. Now, I'm just trying to show you where we are, that sometimes we are very eager. Because, and from my experience, I've had the experience, so I... I live with a lot of stuff, and I, I, I try to make the best decisions in terms of dealing with children. But then you can have a parent who said, but I didn't want you to move my child from here. Yeah. All right. So so this is all I'm saying to you. Thanks very much. Let me run around here quickly, see if we can get a couple of seconds here. Okay, most, most of what I wanted to say earlier was wrapped up in the statement you read. Because yeah. in business, there has to be, there's something we call liability insurance, indemnity insurance. In banking, when someone steals no money in a bank, no. the teller or the no. general manager can't be held liable once procedures are documented and properly followed. But the, the manager has to be able to operate without looking over his shoulder all the time. So I'm saying to principals, you all have to take it this with the boards and the, man, and the ministry to, so you can act and act responsible. The law always said once you have acted in reason, reasonableness in carrying out your duty, then you are not held liable. And I, I think we really got to get through to the ministry and the ministry, the principals got to be able to do these things without fear that they will be held liable. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Brayden, I think you have the last say. Quickly. Um, from the floor and then I'll wrap up. While, while, while I listen to, to the table to my, to my left, and I recognize that there are some, um, some issues that, ha that we have to deal with immediately because out of some fear of um, previous experiences that the, the system would have experienced with children and litigation, the associations are protecting their members. And I believe that we have to get, we call the framework right in relation to teachers, how to deal with sensitive um, situations and ensure that they are protected by law and spell it out clearly so that they will not be fearful to do what is right for their charges. As well, in terms of the, the time frame in which that responses should be given or should be made to the, to the school to the ministry and then to the parent must be wrapped up in a simple template that all schools in the system will adhere to. Thank you very much. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I will just say to you, I have another session which was supposed to start immediately after this, so I'm late for that as well. But I want to say to you, we have to reflect very carefully on how we function to ensure that we can maximize opportunities for effective functioning and for efficient functioning within the context of not just the law, not just the context of the law,
but within the context of ethics and morals. We have a moral obligation to look after the interests of our children. And outside of the instruction which a parent may give, which is in the case that Orson highlighted, that is unfortunate because I have children in school and I would not wish for anyone to leave any of my children unattended or at risk. I have no difficulty with my children being moved. I would try to meet you wherever I can to get them to a medical facility as quickly as I can, but you would want to look after the interests of any child. So within the context of this scenario, I hope that it brings us to a point where we recognize that perhaps we have not been doing all the things that we ought to be doing in the way we ought to do them. But we need to get back to a situation where we are, A, consistent in the application mm -hmm. of all the necessary and reasonable procedures yeah. to expedite care, due care, for our charges. Mm -hmm. And to ensure that we also meet the minimum legal obligations. Because at the end of the day, if we do not document properly and within a timely manner what has happened, that can also whip us at the end. So even though you may take the necessary action to save a life, the paperwork still has to be done to support the action that was taken. All right, You will have unreasonable persons from time to time, but at the end of the day, the effort must be seen to be one which intended to bring about the best possible solution in the interest of the child, the teachers, principal, and the school. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rada.